It's an honor to be with you here tonight. We will talk about some of the biggest challenges of our time. Thankfully, it doesn't end there. We will also turn our attention to the next generation, including the young people in this room, who will inherit this world and lead the way to a brighter time, a brighter future. Yeah. <laughs> My name is John Martinson, and I am a graduate of the School of Sustainability's Executive Master of Sustainability Leadership Program. Yeah! And president of the school's alumni association. I grew up in New York in a second generation immigrant family with a culture of giving of both time and money to charitable causes, of hard work, standing up for social justice and civil liberties and never, ever missing an election. <laughs> I, credit, I credit two very special women in my life with instilling those values in me. My mother, Frances Steyer Sirota Martinson, and my aunt, Marty Farr Steyer, Tom's mother. Both of these strong, independent women inspired a generation of sons and a daughter with these values. Over five decades, I have watched with great admiration Tom's career, his growth as a leader, his marriage to another strong, independent woman, Kat Taylor, and together their dedication to those values through philanthropy, leadership, and raising four amazing kids. Tom spent 26 years running hedge fund Farrell and Capital. After selling his stake in the company, Tom turned his attention to nonprofit advocacy efforts for social justice and environmental causes. He is founder of Next Gen America, which fights for a clean energy economy, immigrant rights, affordable health care, and prosperity for all Americans. In 2014, Time Magazine named him one of the world's most, one of the world's 100 most influential people. In 2015, he joined Bill Gates' Breakthrough Energy Coalition, along with Jeff Bezos, Michael Bloomberg, and others to invest in scientific breakthroughs that provide affordable and reliable clean energy to the world. Tom has done well in life, but he is also approachable and a really great guy. <laughs> <laughs> he remains modest <laughs> and drives a Chevy Bolt. <laughs> Tom will share a story, followed by a lighthearted conversation moderated by Chris Mays. Chris is a professor of practice at ASU and former Arizona Corporation Commissioner who authored Arizona's Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. We join me in welcoming Tom Steiger to ASU. Introduction by my cousin John. <laughs> As I was saying earlier, there's mutually assured destruction. We've known each other for over 60 years. <laughs> At this point, I think he could only say nice things. <laughs> um, I would also like to thank um, President Crow and Professor Mays for welcoming me and for, to the School of Sustainability for hosting me. Um, I do love speaking on college campuses because. Our, our organization is actually called Next Gen America, and actually speaking with the next generation is something which is very stimulating and where I hope that I learn as much as I say. So I'm looking forward in this conversation to as much as possible turning it into a conversation. I hope I talk for a very brief part of time. And let me say that it is a special privilege to me to speak at an institution that measures itself by who they include rather than by who <coughs> others exclude. I love that phrase and I love that idea and I think that that mission to provide a first-rate college education to the greatest number of people possible is something which I've admired for years but in addition I think that principle rests at the heart of the debate which is going on in our, across our country this year. I think it's the divide between inclusion and exclusion, between justice and injustice, 
between right and wrong, and between actual pluralism and fake populism. <laughs> this, is the, this, is, this is the center of the battle that's being waged for the heart and soul of America in 2018. And this university stands for something really central and unbelievably important in terms of the values that this country is supposed to be, and I believe does, represent. So really this is a question that's going on all over America, and the basic question is, who are we? Who is an American? Who isn't an American? Who are we not going to treat as a full citizen? Who are we not going to treat as a full human being? That is actually going to be the question at the heart of the fight between now and November 6th. So this is a conversation which I believe is going to be extremely powerful. And if everyone in the United States, I believe, is going to be participating in this one way or the other. And I think it's actually a great opportunity. I look at this personally as a great opportunity to stand up for what I think of as the basic American values. And I look at everybody else in the United States as having that. I, I'm shocked that it's happening, to be honest. I never thought that we would have to stand up for values that I thought we'd settled somewhere between two and 250 years ago. <laughs> but we do. And actually, it's a gift. You know, I look at my parents' generation who were Depression World War II babies, and they had a chance to definitely reaffirm the meaning of America. And I look at the success of America. It's not where we started but the fact that we've, the progress we've made, the path we've taken to improve more people. And I think we all get a chance this year. And I would say, in particular, for the young people, we re I really feel that it's going to be a question where their values and the participation are going to have this year going to be critical. And I was talking to a young woman who works for us in Pennsylvania who've been working in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, running a Starbucks. And she <coughs> ran it through 16, so Starbucks is a lot about talking to your customers. And the, the young people who were working in the Starbucks were by and large progressives. Pennsylvania obviously went for Trump, but the place where she is, Monroe County, was literally like 49 Hillary, 48 Trump. So it was absolutely right down the middle. And after the election, the people who voted for Trump started to harass the people who were working in the Starbucks because they felt like, you know, we've been sort of pushed down and, you know, we've been, it, it, everything had been polite up to the election and they started to get very aggressive with this young woman whose name is Lizzie Morasco. And she quit. She was so upset about what was going on in her job and the conversations that she was having that she quit and she went to work for us. <laughs> and she, last year, she knocked on 2,400 doors that she and her team flipped the local county um, supervisors. And Pennsylvania is going to be one of the critical states in terms of the Congress. So she actually took her very negative experience as somebody, she's a very good organizer. I mean, she actually ran a great, sort of funny. She'd run a great Starbucks. <laughs> and it's not that different in terms of managing people, organizing conversations, being personable, telling your story, and actually getting into the conversation. She took the opportunity that she had and her skills to do that in a very forceful and effective way. And one way or the other, that is what we believe at NextGen is going to make the difference in 2018. You know, we believe in the power of Americans talking to Americans. And everything that we're going to do is to try and enable that experience, empower people so that they can do that. Um, let me say this. The person who runs all of our grassroots organization is the woman who's sitting up there, Heather Hargreaves. So to the extent you're interested in participating, mm -hmm. I do promise you that she can give you all of the information about what we do and 
how we and how we do it. But I think the biggest value that we see politically is participation. We believe that the answer to America's problems is more small d democracy. That if people are engaged, if they are registered, young people in particular, we believe are passionate, <coughs> knowledgeable, but by and large do not trust. What we found is young people don't trust our political system. They don't believe either party is, is representing their interests and speaking to them. <coughs> and so the turnout amongst young people over the last decade has been at record lows. So when we look at um, 2014, the largest age cohort in the United States is the millennials, bigger than the boomers. In 2014, people under 35 voted, 23% of the people under 35 voted, just so you know. Of people over 65, 59% voted, so more than two and a half times. So in addition, a, a normal turnout in a midterm election starts with a four. So 23%, in just to, if it, I'm speaking in Arizona, I will tell you as a Californian that in California, the number was 14%. It was the, the turnout in 2014 was the lowest in American history since 1942. And in 1942, we had millions of Americans overseas fighting in World War II, who by definition could not. Because you know, we didn't have the communications apparatus that would enable, enable them to vote. So actually what's happened is that we've had <coughs> increasingly low turnout. I will also say that the millennial generation is the most diverse generation in American history. We, I mean, I'm sure we see it in Arizona, we definitely see it in California. And it's the most progressive. Across the country, people under the age of 35 are the most progressive group of anyone. And what, and our experience, we have been organizing millennials for years. I have four kids who are between the ages of 24 and 29. I spend a lot of time with people who are under the age of 35. <laughs> And they are all extremely switched on and knowledgeable. And they all are very cynical about our political system in terms of trusting what's going on and believing what people say and thinking. You know, millennials, you guys have all grown up with people trying to take advantage of you online, trying to sell you things. And my kids and their friends, and I think millennials in general, are really good at knowing when someone's BSing you. Mm -hmm. when someone's trying to take advantage because it's been happening since you were like two. <laughs> and so one of the things that we believe in is extreme transparency, extreme honesty, because we think anything else isn't going to, I mean, first of all, it's right. I mean, it's sort of like everybody's mom taught him that when they were two years old. And it is, you know, we all know it's right. It's also the only effective thing. We want, as we watch people try and hide things, as we watch people try and prevaricate and lie, every single time it comes out, it is almost impossible in public life for people to fool you. There's just too much transparency and too much coverage. And that's something where, you know, I think if you go into that kind of life, you have to expect that. That is the way it's going to go. So let me say this. From now until November 6th, which is Election Day, Organizers with Next Gen America will be registering and mobilizing young people to elect progressives up and down the ballot. We're going to be in California, Florida, Iowa, Michigan, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, <coughs> Virginia, Wisconsin, and Arizona. Yeah. If you listen to those states, they're not random. <laughs> Those are the swings, with the exception of California, which actually, from the point of view of the Congress of the United States, is a critical swing state, believe it or not. Of the 24 congressional districts held by Republicans, which Hillary Clinton won, seven are in California. Four of them are in Orange County. So believe it or not, California is a swing state 
when it comes to flipping the House of Representatives. But it's my opinion that the biggest battleground state in the United States in 2018 is going to be Arizona. Mm. This <laughs> because there's just so much stuff up. Everything is going to be up. And this is a state that's very much is or isn't in transition. And so there's going to be, I think, an incredible competitive political environment in this state unlike one, anyone that anyone has ever seen here before and maybe unlike one that anyone has seen anywhere before. This is going to be, in terms of the United States, it's not just going to be Arizona. Every one of those other states that I mentioned is going to see a competitive political environment that I think is going to shock everybody and knock everybody's socks off. Because I think we just see two such different views of what America is supposed to be doing, of the values system that we're supposed to be living up to, of whom we're trying to include and exclude. And I think that the, you know, I, a lot of my friends, including some of my elected official friends, would like to believe that we're going to a less partisan, more cooperative and compromising world. And I think virtually everybody in America would like that to be true. Yeah. Let me say, I don't see it. <laughs> because I think if you watch the news, if you read the paper, you can see every single day people going like this. I do, you know, we expect this to be an incredibly competitive, hard fought, unbelievably expensive and vituperative campaign. I, I hate saying that, but I think it's true. And I think that in Arizona, that is going to be true. We're going to have two really, really different views. I mean, I don't know how seriously to take Sheriff Arpaio, but he is listed to be running. You know, that some of the people running are going to be what we saw in 2017 in the statewide elections, which were Virginia, Alabama, New Jersey had statewide elections, and in every one of them, the Republican candidate went to an extreme, hard right, racially um, explosive campaign. In every single one, I mean, if Alabama got the most coverage because that guy was such a outlier in so many different ways, <laughs> including saying that slavery was good, which I never thought I would hear in the United States of America, in my entire life. But it's also, if you went back and looked at the Virginia campaign in New Jersey, in states where you would think certain New Jersey is a purple state or a blue state, and Virginia is very much of a purple state, the campaigns went to a racist place that was very, very shocking as someone who was in what participated. So when we look at Arizona and we think about millennials, if you, Donald Trump won this state by 85,000 votes. And I may get my numbers wrong, but I know there are more students. <laughs> yeah. So I know, I'm pretty sure that every day day as you voted in 2016, mm -hmm. so what's going to be necessary is for everyone there to get one friend to vote. <laughs> and let me say, I mean, we're going to be on 13 campuses across Arizona, and we're going to be on community community colleges, and we're going to be going for t trying to interact and talk to millennials who are not in school, because the majority of people under 35 probably aren't at a residential campus, and they're still citizens, they're still important, we still need their participation, we still need their um, I will also say this, we believe that the difference in terms of platform is going to be shocking as well. That I think part of this is about treating the rights and dignity of Americans. That we, you know, we said we do not compromise on the rights and dignities of America. We're not willing to say you can be half prejudiced or half racist. We're, we don't compromise. And that's something that is going to be absolutely on the table in 2018. 
it was on the table in 2017 and 2016 and it's not going away. And that's one thing. But there is also going to be a real question, if you'll excuse me saying that, about money. We are going to see in the budget that this president proposes on February 12th, where the trillion and a half dollars that we're not going to get in tax revenues are going to come from. And they're going to come from programs that go directly to human beings. So every single program that we think of as investing in the success and future of the American people will be cut. When you think about the mission, the mission of Arizona State University, who you're trying to serve, what you're trying to accomplish, and the underlying view of society that goes into that vision. The idea about inclusion, about education, making people successful in the 21st century, every single part of that vision will be under attack. They will, they will cut education, they will cut health care, they will, they will risk retirement benefits, they will go after training. They already said that they were going to, we're sitting here in the School of Sustainability, they're talking about cutting research in clean energy by 72%. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, I, when they talk about we're an innovation economy, I don't know how you're an innovation economy if you don't do research. Yeah. Seriously. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you are a technologically competitive economy if your people aren't educated and technologically competent. I don't, it, the, the very mission of this institution is directly at odds with the vision of the future which is about going backwards. You know, where it isn't about education, it's about literally building a wall around the country, going back to old-fashioned, dirty fuels, and having manufacturing lines that were cutting edge in 1910. <laughs> that is not going to cut it in the 21st century, honest to God. And so there is going to be a huge value question here across the board. So, let me say this too. I mean, obviously, we're running a campaign to try and impeach this guy. So, we strongly believe that he has done things that more than meet the criteria for him to be impeached. If you read the paper, if you listen to the news, you will see that on a daily basis, the case that we made three months ago that we thought was a lay down, honest to goodness, get stronger every single day, and will get stronger every single day until November 6th. I mean, we, we always thought we have a great case, but every day is going to make this more obvious. And that's, in fact, if you, if you listen to the news, unless you're reading Breitbart, <laughs> every single day makes the case that, yes, the statements we've made are just true, but they're truer today than yesterday, and they'll be truer tomorrow than today. That's where we're going. So, you know, we are pushing people, and I'm definitely pushing all of you to be part of this conversation and this process. You know, there's, I have a 97 year old friend who says democracy is not a spectator sport, it doesn't work. The way that we will get a terrible outcome this year. The way that our country will not be the leading country in the world is if we don't participate. That will be the way that we will end up with the kind of despotism that threatens us. I actually believe that. Is if not because we agree, because no one in this room is going to think, yes, you know, we should get rid of small d democracy. No, no one can say that. It's if we acquiesce to it. It's just if we don't stand up against it. Doing nothing is a choice. Doing nothing is actually the very thing that it will kill us. Unless we're active and stand up and have the conversation and force the truth, then in fact they will win. Because we'll get used to the idea that there's no such thing as objective truth. That you know maybe climate change isn't happening. Maybe the FBI really is a communist cell organization. <laughs> All the other things that they say as if they might be true, which just aren't true. So we are going to be very committed. 
and there is someone who can tell you how to do it. I think Lizzie Marasco is the, the extreme example of someone who decided not just to take it on in her private time, but to take it on full time. We are going to need actual citizen participation, you know, in terms of signing up for a petition, in terms of calling congressmen, in terms of calling meetings, in terms of going to the law. And let me say, I don't feel shy about asking people to have a meaningful life. That's actually how I see this for myself. As someone who's older than virtually everybody in this room, except my cousin, who's a lot older than I am. <laughs> I can tell you that as you get older, it becomes increasingly important to think that you've had a meaningful life while you're walking on the earth. That a lot of the other things that you thought were so important maybe aren't as important as you thought. But the idea that there was a purpose for being here, that you actually think you left the campsite in a better shape than when you got there becomes increasingly important. And so I view this, I never feel sorry for myself about this. You know, it's kind of, people say, like, can you believe you guys are doing it? And I feel like, you know what? It's great. It's great. Because that means we get a chance to stand up for what we believe. And we need to refresh those beliefs. That if we're just sitting around passively, country can go absolutely to hell. And so we get a chance to do what my parents did, which is to you know, stand up against something that is absolutely wrong. And maybe then we will go back to what everybody in America wants, which is a sense that we're all pulling for the same thing. And if we disagree, then we'll compromise because we trust each other to be trying to get to the right place. That's what is supposed to be happening in America. That if you disagree on the way to get there, you don't disagree about where you're trying to get or what our values are. That's traditional America. That is not where we are in 2018. This is going to be a very, very tough year. And I think that unless people who are willing to stand up for what we would think of as the values of this university and the values of this country, then we're going to lose. And I think that, you know, we're all, at, at next gen, honestly, goodness, we're all in because we think it's the right thing to do, and also it's the best opportunity we'll ever have to make a difference. So with that, I would love to close this and take any questions you have.
way of trying to make that utility the, the largest public power utility in America, at least the most powerful public power utility in America, try to get off of coal and go more renewables. So Paul, great, great to have you here. Um, Tom, you, um, you mentioned uh, a, a little bit about NextGen's commitment to, uh, to combating climate change. And um, that has been a hallmark of your philanthropy uh, and your activism. I'm curious, why did you decide to focus so much of your money and your time on that issue? What, what in your past or what in you uh, made you do that? I mean, there was a million things you could have done with your life, um, and, and, and you chose that. So you chose to start with that. So. You know, I had the, I spent 35 years as an investor, basically investing for college endowments and foundations. And that meant spending a lot of time thinking about how different countries, different economic systems and political systems worked, and why the United States was so much better than others. And so I'm a pretty parochial American. I mean, and I believe our system is fantastic, and in, in general, my, my definition of the American system is we're loud and rude people. We <laughs> yell at each other, and we're also really practical leaders. So we yell at each other, we compromise, we solve the problem, we move on. And you know, every now outside the country goes like, you guys are so rude. It's like, yeah, we are. And by the way, we just solved your problem 10 years ago. <laughs> That's America to me. And I don't mind the yell, as long as everybody's trying to get to the right place, trusting each other to try and get to the right place, compromising, solving the problem, moving on. And for some reason, it, we weren't doing it in climate. And I thought, my gosh, this is just crazy because this is, a, this is something that will hit all of us, but it's a perfect solution for America. Global problem, technological solution. It should come from everywhere, every part of the country, every kind of person, every background, every income level. It's like World War II. We'll solve the world's biggest problem just the way we always do. We'll be better for it. We'll create the new industries. We'll create tons of jobs for ourselves. And also, we'll do the right thing. And that's what America's about, all that. So I thought, I, I really thought everything I did was bipartisan. I had a bunch of friends who were mostly non-elected Republicans like George Schultz, who had four cabinet positions, and Hank Paulson, and you know Mike Bloomberg, and I felt like we can pull people together and come up with these solutions, and it's, the whole country will be better for it in so many different ways. So I thought, for some reason, it isn't happening, so that's just a great chance to try and wade in and make it a nonpartisan problem, which, of course, did not happen. <laughs> It turned into the most partisan thing, which is hard for me, it's still hard for me to believe that something which is so evidence-based, so technological, so scientific, and so important is something where we're the only country in the world left not part of the Paris Accord. Right, and that, that's my next question. So, so essentially, President Trump has announced we're pulling out, although that won't happen right away. Right. What do you think is the antidote to that? What's the answer? Is it acting at the state level through renewable portfolio standards? Is it a carbon tax? Is it, um, is it just action by subnationals like states and cities? What do you see? How does America exercise leadership in that area now? And a sort of second question would be, you see a bunch of millennials up here and a whole bunch of folks who care a lot about sustainability. What do you advise these guys, uh, how they can have Well, that? the two places where we're going to make a lot of progress during this administration are going to be states, because we are going to see increasing leadership. It's, it's going to be in the interest of state leaders to lead here. You know, Jerry Brown, who's the governor of California, who's 79 years old, I believe, is, I believe he, that he is ambitiously writing his legacy as the, the governor who is leading the United States towards sustainability and action on climate change. And I think that every elected official is going, who is not in the federal government is going to have the opportunity to write his or her 
legacy as you know, someone who made a dramatic contribution and can use that to further his or her career. So I believe we're going to see a lot out of the states because it's in the interest of Governor Cuomo and it's in the interest of Governor Murphy and it's in the interest of Kate Brown, who's the governor of Oregon. And I think that people are going it, to, it, because it's the right thing to do and it's going to be good for people. The other thing that's true is we're going to see businesses, the tech is there. You know, I, I, I've been doing this for quite a while, and for a while we were saying, the tech will be there. <laughs> right. I swear the tech right. will be there, right. because in California we're used to decline curves, and I promise you we're going to get there. But we're there. Yeah. You know, I believe, we just looked at the bids for energy in Colorado, and the solar and wind bids with battery storage were cheaper than fossil fuels. Yeah. So we're there. Yeah. And Arizona can be cheaper than freaking Colorado. Yeah. Take a look up. up. <laughs> so I believe we're going to see real leadership. But the, the thing I would say to the young people, that the, the, what I learned that you don't have to learn because I've already made the mistake, is that <laughs> I thought we were going to do this and I was so looking forward to having everybody link arms like World War II. I mean, there is great energy knowledge in Texas. Really. Mm -hmm. There is great energy knowledge. There's great manu small manufacturing capability in Ohio that we don't have in California. Those guys have been servicing the auto companies and the auto industry for decades, for a century. They have a lot of great small manufacturing companies that are perfect for this. So I felt like, boy, this every part of the country is going to be able to contribute in their own unique way. And that's going to be fantastic for us because it's also going to be a huge job creator in different ways around the country. No. The way that we're going to get this at the federal level is by winning. That's the only way we're going to get this. We are, we are going to have to win and make it clear that being on the wrong side of this is going to end your career. And then we're going to get it. But until people believe that, we're not going to get it at the federal level. So that's what I suspected your answer was, that ultimately it's about winning elections. It um, is, you know, and it's such a disappointment to say that. <laughs> it, it, it really is. Because well, if yeah. you look at the history of the Republican Party, they've led most of the environmental moves in the United States for a hundred right. years. That's right. They've been traditional conservationists, an old word, but a word that had great resonance. And they actually have passed, you know, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, created the EPA, all this stuff was under Republicans. And I felt that when push came to shove, that's where we'd go. Yeah. It's not true, though. I mean, I, that I, I don't want to alibi them. I really don't, and I feel that we've been alibying them for too long. They're lying about this. And they're <laughs> lying about it because they get campaign contributions if they lie, and they don't if they tell the truth. And so they've been lying about this for 10 years. And it's very upsetting as an American. As a Republican sitting next to you. <laughs> I, I just, we should tell the truth. I mean, I know it's rude, but it's the truth. And this is my frustration as well. I, I, I agree with you. Um, but, but let me ask you this. There are those who say, well, look, and, and as an investor, and a major investor, and, and former owner of a hedge fund, still an investor in that hedge fund, would you agree that there is now incredible pressure being brought to bear on utilities and states by companies like Apple, Google, uh, Microsoft, all of whom now have 100% green energy and terminal goals? Can that, what you're saying is that's yes. not enough, not enough. It isn't, you know, they, but, they, they will say, if you want us to build the Apple facility in Utah, right. you got to have clean energy. We're not going there and burning coal. So you can get us, but you can't get us unless you have clean energy. And that is a big pressure in Indiana, some bright red states, where people definitely want the growth, definitely want the jobs, and there's pressure. But I would, look, you know, to me, to get this, that isn't good enough. And, and, and I, again, and I, excuse me for the younger people, but I go back to World War II. Because in World War II, FDR called in the three big automakers and said, look, you know, we're in a pitch battle for our lives. And I want to know, 
what percentage of your passenger car production you can commit to us to making tanks and planes and warships because we're way behind our opponents and unless we have the equipment we're going to get killed so and they, they they went back and they said you know they thought it over for a couple of days literally a couple of days not a month not a week a couple again and said you know we can commit to 20 to 25 percent you know that we're not going to do capacity cars. We're just going to dedicate it to the war effort. And he said, "That's good. I have a number too. It's a hundred percent. You will do a hundred percent for us, which is exactly what they did. That's how we won World War II. Because the government said, we're all in. We're not at twenty to twenty-five percent and pretending this doesn't make any difference. And if we're going to if we're going to win, if we're going to solve this problem, if this." school of sustainability is in fact going to work, then someone's going to have to say, we're actually going to solve this. We are going to be all in until we solve this. And, unless, and so I don't believe that the good thinkings of corporations is going to be enough. I don't believe it for a second. I believe it's an economy-wide, society-wide thing where my original vision, which was every American's brilliance and hard work and capability goes towards the goal, that's how we win big things. So uh, let me ask you a, a little bit of a tough question. So, Bring it on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the ex-newspaper reporter in me. Um, you are here, and you are traveling the country, and you're having a huge impact. I noticed that your television ads ran on impeachment in the middle of Trump's State of the Union. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to have had them in the Congress of the United States. I know, I'll bet. And you got an interesting new one, even, and they're all running in Arizona, by the way. Yeah, so I find that interesting too, and now I know why. But um, uh, you um, bring to bear incredible wealth, and you're able to do that. So do the Koch brothers. Um, a lot of people believe that there's a problem with that. How do you answer that criticism, and how do we get back to the point where average people feel like they can have as much impact as Tom mm -hmm. Steyer and David Koch can? So first, let me say this. I totally believe that money in politics is out of control. Totally believe it. I think that Citizens United is a terrible decision. I don't believe corporations are people. I don't. I don't believe that money is speech. So I believe we've gotten into a terrible place in terms of how money is affecting politics. And it, it, I think it's got to be reformed for us to really retake our I say to people, we need a democracy of people where everyone's treated equally, not every dollar is treated equally. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. Having said that, this is the system we have. This system is not perfect. I love this system, but this system is far from perfect. So I look at it and I say, with the imperfections and strongly believing that the money on the other side is much multiples of whatever I or anyone on the progressive side puts up, how can I do this in a way that has integrity? And I'll tell you why we think we're totally different from the Coke brothers. We're transparent. You know, I will come and sit here and answer your questions. I really will. You are not going to get Charles and David Koch here and ask them what they're spending in Arizona this year and why. So we will do transparency. We also, I don't get, a, you know, what we're standing for does not pay my bottom line. This is not an investment for me in with a money return. This is an investment for me in a productive life and, a, and the things I believe in. So, I mean, I... Don't feel sorry for one second about doing this. I think this is a great thing to do. But they are investing in things where that just pays them. That tax bill, <laughs> that tax bill is going to give the Cokes 100 to 1 on all the money they ever spent on politics. So that tax, you know, nothing that I'm pushing is going to make me a nickel. You know, we specifically said we will never invest in clean energy except through a foundation which we could never get the money from because I don't want people to say you're pushing clean energy so that your clean energy investments will make you rich. It's not true. We, it's, it's, we made sure that that wouldn't happen. So from our standpoint, 
<clears throat> what we're, and the third thing I'd say is this. Our goal is the broadest democracy. Our goal is to enable the people of the United States to have more power. So if we do an impeachment petition, it's only important if people sign up. If you guys sign our petition, and, which is, by the way, www. <laughs> it's only the number that matters. It's only representing, it's only the collective voice that matters. If we go door to door or we're on the campus of ASU to try and register and engage students and make sure that they participate, all we're trying to do is increase the number of people who are included in the vote, whose voice gets counted, and we specifically do it in the underrepresented groups. We specifically do it for young people. We specifically do it for people of color because we feel that they're underrepresented in our democracy. And therefore, their interests are underrepresented. You know, my brother's a child advocate, and he'll always say, you know, at the end of the Second World War, old people were poor but could vote. And young people were poor and they couldn't vote. And old people are a hell of a lot better off than young people now. The you know, poorest people in the United States are young people. And particularly, particularly people who aren't 18 yet. So speaking of those young people, and I know you've got a passion for millennials, and we have a lot of them in the room here, many of whom are getting ready to go out into the world, get jobs, start their lives, start their careers. Um, and they're going to have successes and failures. Could you talk about a failure you've had in your life that was important, or maybe say your favorite failure? My favorite failure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'd say this. When I look back, what I'm dissatisfied with in myself is if I'm actually not tough enough on living up to my own values. And so if I think back to the things that I regret, it is if I compromise on my values, which is easy to do because no one likes to be a rigid pain in the neck. <laughs> Honestly. And, and it, it's kind of, especially if you're running organizations, I like to run really flat organizations and believe that my coworkers are adults who, make, who are going to make good decisions and therefore it's like a team. You know, you don't want to play center forward and goalie. If you're playing center forward, you trust the goalie to stop the shots, and vice versa. And that's how I like to think. The only things that I regret is in the past is if I actually believed something and wasn't strong enough in making it happen. And the things that I'm happiest about are when I did, when it was like extremely pain. It's usually really painful to do, but when I've done it and when I think back. To, I remember, we, we, I'll tell you one story. So I had a, one of the people who I worked with wanted to buy a subprime originator after the thing had blown up. <laughs> these, and so I went and I said, look, I don't know if it's a good investment or not, but these guys have a terrible reputation for being crooks. And I don't really want to be in that business. So the only thing I, I insist on meeting the CEO and the, the, the senior people to find out if they're crooks. Because that's my threshold. I won't do it. So I go down and I say, and basically get in a room and I say, are you guys honest? <laughs> and the guy looks at And they're supposed to be the best. He goes, well, we're not Boy Scouts. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I can't do this. They call me up the next Saturday night. And I'm lying in bed at 11 o'clock with my wife. And we're reading. And they call me up and they say, well, we have this deal to buy this company. 512 million bucks. Fill or kill in 30 minutes. If you don't say yes, they're going to sell it to somebody else in 30 minutes. So I'm lying in bed and I just don't want to do this. And my wife is going, I hope you're not thinking about saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, like, you guys, you know, I really don't think this is a great idea. And they're like, no, there are 30 people on the phone going, yes, 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 yes. So finally we come to no. And the 30 people are extremely upset. One by one over the next two weeks, they come to see me in my office. And they basically say, so this was probably 10 years ago, 11 years ago, so I was 50. They basically came in and said, you know, it's so great to have worked to work with you. And you know, you should know you are over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> you are the biggest loser I've ever met. 
So, and, I, and it was actually super painful, but the truth of the matter is, that was success. Mm -hmm. That actually thinking, no, we're not gonna do that. I don't wanna do that. That's not the right thing to do is the thing that I remember, and I think back, and it was definitely my wife yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, I think about that, and I think, you know, that is a moment when I would, that I will remember forever thinking, wow, you know, we could have done the wrong thing, and we did the right thing. And I think, when I talk, honest to God, that, if you're tempted, it's always, there's tons and tons of pressure, and sticking up for what you believe in is really, really satisfying in the long run and will lead to much, much better things. Well, going back a little bit to sustainability, last couple questions, and speaking of doing the right thing, um, you know, I mentioned we have the Navajo Nation represented here. Um, there are a lot of communities like the Navajo Nation that have been host to uh, big coal plants, coal mines. They have provided very inexpensive power to the rest of us, to the state of Arizona for a lot of years. They have shouldered the burden of the pollution from those plants. Um, and now because of environmental activists like you and me and many others um, who have fought for clean energy, those coal plants are being shut down. So I'm, I'm curious, have you, have you thought through what obligations we all have as a nation to these communities to help them recover? I certainly have. This is a critical issue, and it really goes to the heart of what I started out by saying, which had to do with inclusivity. It also has to do, in my mind, with connectivity and education and justice. So let's talk for a second about coal mining and coal plants. Dirty air and dirty water are concentrated in poor communities and communities of color in the United States. So it may, be, it may sound like cheap energy, but by the time you have a 15-year lower life expectancy, it ain't that cheap. And so when I think about the transition that I think has to happen, I think that the responsibility of this country to the people in those communities is entire, you know, we have a deep responsibility to other Americans. That was my original point, is, no, it, it's not just, I, I truly believe that moving to clean energy, our, we did a study for a year that shows it'll create <laughs> 2 million net jobs, but it's, that's not good enough. If they're not in the communities where people are being hurt, then you're not really dealing. We, we create 50,000 clean energy jobs in California a year, every year. But that doesn't matter, because if you're living Near, if you're working at that coal plant or if you're living in West Virginia and you're making $82 an hour as a coal miner, next stop, $23 an hour. The fact that we're creating 50,000 jobs in California doesn't feel relevant, and it isn't relevant. So when we talk about this, we have an absolute obligation to the communities that are going, which are usually rural, to connect them in so many ways, and in particular, to try and use them in terms of creating the new parts of it, specifically there. Because I think that, that when I look at Mr. Trump, so I mean, we're trying to impeach him. Obviously, I don't have a lot of you know, positive feelings for him. But he was addressing real, real fears and real pain, mm -hmm. and a real sense of being abandoned. And the question you're asking me is, are we going to abandon those people or are we, in fact, going to put in the time and resources and effort to try and include them in the future, in, in a growing future, where all of the things that are inevitably happening, like globalization, like the IT revolution, like clean energy, are going to happen. And the question is, how do we make it so they're on the right end of that? So instead of those things being threats, they can be part, that those can be forces that are pushing them and their families to a better life. Unless we do that, I don't think we're living up to our responsibility. And I think that, that the exact same question, not just in coal, but in manufacturing. People who are, if we were in a small town in Wisconsin with one manufacturing plant, we would be on pins and needles because we would think at some point between automation and globalization, that plant's under threat. It absolutely is under threat. 
the question is, those people aren't stupid. Those people are hardworking. Those people have the same ambitions that the people sitting in this room do. And the question is, how do we literally connect them through broadband and education and roads to the part of the economy that's going to inevitably grow so that they participate in that? So that those big, broad changes aren't threats, but become things that actually push their communities into a better direction. And that is happening in the United States. It's not happening everywhere by a long shot. But you can look around the United States and see that the small towns and the communities that are doing that are thriving. And that's why people are so anxious to get the Amazons of the world and the FedExes of the world and the people who are part of that. And so you know, I think to the extent that we abandon those people, do the right thing on an environmental basis and a wrong thing in terms of justice and equality, then it's a wrong thing. Thank you. We appreciate that. And the last question for me, and this is the former political reporter in me coming out, I, I got to ask you, Tom, because you sound a lot like, uh, I covered two presidential campaigns, you sound a lot like a guy who might just be running for president. <laughs> Are you running for president in 2020? Well, here's what I said. Anyone who's thinking past November 6, 2018, is doing a disservice to everybody else. Because we, I said we're all in on November 6, 2018. We don't know where we're going to be on November 7. We truly don't know where we're going to be in Arizona. There's so many seats here that are open. We don't know what the values are going to be represented from top to bottom of this state and from top to bottom in every other state and in Washington, D.C. And I believe that we're at a time of extreme peril. So for the people who are worried about 2020, I would say, really? Let's do, show us how great you are between now and November 6th. Because as far as I'm concerned, you can't lose it. Honestly, I, I really feel like this is a pivotal year for the United States. And if you think about it, we've only had this for one year. We're one year in. I don't believe, four years of this will cost us at a level that's hard to imagine. That's why I mean we really will. So as far as we're concerned, 2020, my goodness, I can't even, the stuff I'm reading in the paper, I'm not sure how we get it through March. Right. <laughs> right. Excellent. Thank you. OK, questions uh, from, do we have enough time? Are you sure? Yeah, Tom, do you want to take a couple of questions? I, listen, questions? I have nothing going on tonight. Yeah. Anything else here has a personal life and a you know, work to do. I'm like, it's okay? whatever. Let's Let's ask. Um, questions from some students, maybe. Or uh, uh, how about right here, and then we'll go to Randy. Uh, hi, my name is Taylor. I first just want to thank you so much for being here and talking to us all. Total pleasure. Arizona, as you mentioned, is a swing state. Um, and I just want to ask you, you mentioned the graduate from the University of Arizona. And so in that opportunity, I get to go on the stage and talk to a lot of people about the issues that most affect us here in Arizona. Thank you. Um, overwhelmingly, the issue that I hear about specifically with our state is the state of our public K-12 education system. Mm. Particularly how that pertains to businesses left and right choosing not to come to Arizona because of the state of our public K-12 education system. Across the board, this would be an amazing place for them to be, especially in the solar industry. Yeah. So my question is that in a state that's trying to develop the solar industry, how do we convince these companies to come here when we cannot convince even regular companies to come because we have a bad climate for education system? How do we develop this industry? Well, I think, I, I do think that Arizona has some fairly obvious <laughs> advantages for solar <laughs> and not just the sun but also the the capacity of this state to do utility grade solar has got to be phenomenal I haven't studied it but common sense tells me it's got to be phenomenal and I believe that the chance particularly if we get a big um, regional grid so that the energy can go back and forth for this state to grow jobs here and really create something amazing is huge that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is this. When I think about success in the 21st century, I mean, think about what's driving success around the world. 
It is information technology and education. It is not going, you know, I, I think the idea that a repetitive physical task is going to pay a great, you know, wage per hour in the age of, of robots is pretty hard to believe. That, you know, that kind of task is going to be cheaper and better done by machines. So when I think about the success going forward of a state or of a country, it is going to be by investing in the capabilities, health, and productivity of its citizens. And if you look around the world at the places that are really successful, they're places that have really productive citizens. You know, and you look at Japan, they have no natural resources whatsoever. The places that have great natural resources, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, <coughs> Russia. We don't want to be any of those places. We really don't. We want to be all the places where the people are well-educated, productive, healthy, where they have a great relationship, where they are, in effect, the society works for them and they work for the society. Mm. And I don't think in the 21st century there's any, the, the, the old ideas about success, which is natural resources and guns, <laughs> no. Well, it's true. You know, in the old days, the, the richest country in the world was the country that took over all the other countries. That's not going to work. That's a terrible idea. The thing that's going to work is investing in ourselves, making us the engine of success. And so when I think about Arizona, you have an incredible opportunity to do that. I think the West is very open to that idea and very open to the idea of change technology and progress and optimism, which I think is hugely important. So I, when I think about this state, there's absolutely no reason why this state should not be incredibly prosperous and incredibly inclusive. And I think the two go hand in hand. And isn't that really the point of this university? Randy. So along the Public Utility Commissions across the country really are doing this value of solar thing where they're trying to put a number on how much the value of solar is. And here in Arizona, the Arizona Corporation Commission decided that they couldn't really put an actual number on it, so they made it zero. Like, there, how can anyone argue that there's no, um, sorry, there's no uh, societal, you know, positive from clean energy and clean Air, right? We 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 know this as just a ingrained thing, like when we were two, right? <laughs> so how how do we convince our commission? Well, you know, I don't this? see this as I don't see this as any different from arguing that you don't believe that the climate is changing and that you know there's no piece of information that's going to change your mind about that. The fact of the matter is that's a political decision. You know, the, one of the other things that George Schultz likes to say is, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And so I look at this and I say, that is, you know, look, John and I are first cousins. It has never worked in our family to go to the dining table and say, I'm smarter than you, I'm better educated than you, shut the hell up and I'll tell you what to do. And those are our families. So to say it to someone you're not even related to, it really isn't good. And that's why, honestly, I changed my opinion about how to go about this and became so much more political. Because I feel like the only way to make this work is to change up the people. And to make the people who are doing that realize, if I do that, I'm going to lose my job. Until they think they're going to lose their job, they're going to keep doing that because it's in the interest of their career. And that's really what we're dealing with here, is people I, I was teasing that earlier, where you say, the end of the world or my career? I'm going with my career. <laughs> <laughs> that, that does, uh, as a former politician, I can tell you that is true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for being here. I'm, I'm Brett Fanshawe. I'm the director of the Environment America's Solar Campaign. 
And uh, I spent my first two summers in Arizona knocking on doors across the state, uh, talking to people about environmental issues. And as you know, Arizona you know, is pretty evenly split uh, for voter registration, uh, Republicans first, then independents, and then Democrats. And I'm interested, like, what, um, what lessons are, is NextGen and you are going to take away from all your work in Arizona this year to win on clean energy across the country and to, to win over the independents and, and Republican voters that we're going to need? Well, you know, that's a great question. And actually, we have, believe it or not, have paid our dues on this one. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that you have to know about human beings is they care about local human issues. You know, I always say no one in California is related to a polar bear. No polar. So if you really think that that's how people are going to change their votes, you're kidding yourself. People vote based on immediate impacts to themselves, their families, and their communities, the people they love. So when you talk about solar, or you talk about clean energy, or you talk about climate, the things that we've always felt you have to talk about are health and jobs. And unless you can talk about those credibly and mean it, and unless you're talking about it in every community, then you're not going to win, and you probably don't deserve to win. So I, I, in 2010, we ran a statewide proposition in California that I co-chaired with George Schultz basically trying to preserve progressive energy laws. And the two big takeaways are, one, we talk about jobs and health specific to each community. And I will say this, 2,500 jobs in your community beats 2 million ephemeral jobs across the United States of America that you don't know who's going to get them. So that's the first thing. And in terms of health, it really is, the, the, the dirty air and the dirty water really are concentrated in communities. And for those communities, you know, it, it is not atypical. West Fresno, which is a poor Latino community, has a 22-year lower life expectancy than North Fresno, which is two miles away. And, you know, th there's a lot of pollution there. A, a ton of pollution, there's a kid. It, it's gross. But my point is, those are the two things. And the other thing that you have to re remember is, when you think about who the environmentalists are in Arizona, or California, or the United States writ large, it's not who you think it is. Number one group is Latinos. Latinos care on these outsides. Number two group, African Americans. Number three group, Asian Americans. And I don't know the number on Native Americans. I'm sure it's really high. But the truth of the matter is, Everyone has an image in their head of who they think is a member. And I love Mike Brood in the Sierra Club, but they think, who's a member of the Sierra Club? But actually, and those are important people, but the fact of the matter is if you look and if you do the study in Arizona, the number one group will be supportive of every one of these things is going to be left And it's going to, the only reason I say it is, it isn't what people expect. The fact of the matter is, this is a much broader, when you get down to the nub of this, to the real personal part of this, to the justice part of this, the justice part of environmental justice, you'll see that this is a broadly important issue to human beings and their lives. And that's what you need to win a political. If it's not, you, you know, I always say to people, most people in America think that if 90% of Americans want something, they get it. I mean, that's a logical thing. You know, we elect these people. If 90% of the people want something, then they're going to think it's a good thing to do. That's not true, just to be clear. 92% of Americans want background checks on guns. More Republicans than Democrats want background checks on guns, just so you know. 70% of NRA members want background checks on guns. There's no reason. I mean, this is just to see if you're a spousal abuser, a felon, or a certifiably crazy person. Most people don't think those want those people to be wandering around with handguns. We don't have background checks on guns, and it's off the table. And the reason is 8% vote on this, and the 92% don't. So unless it's a critical human issue that moves the voters, that swings elections, <coughs> 92% is not enough. Mm.
And is that, I know that sounds crazy, but so when you talk about this, if you're not talking about deep human issues in politics, you're not talking, except to yourself. One last question. Following up on the importance of Latino voters, of course we have such a high population of them here in Arizona, um, and all the cries of um, illegal voters and all the um, voter intimidation that's been happening, and the concern for how that might play out in 2018, how can we make sure that our Latino neighbors are safe at the polls so they can vote? So you're obviously asking someone who believes that the broadest possible participation and the broadest possible democracy is our savior. So it's really important for us that as many people are allowed to participate as possible. And obviously, there have been studies to see if they could show any true voter fraud and they've been, you know they've never been able to show any voter fraud and they said that's because it's so skillfully done that you can't find it <laughs> <laughs> actually that was their mind service is amazing but um i don't know what it, there is going to have to be i do believe that there's going to be a, a at least potential large-scale attempt to intimidate <coughs> and i know that there are large-scale attempts to take the franchise away from Americans. I don't know that it's happened in Arizona, but I was reading the studies about Wisconsin last year where 100,000 African Americans were prevented from voting and the state flipped, I think, 13,000 votes. And that was one where, and I've talked to the people who have gone through this, and it's a systematic attempt to prevent people from being registered so when they show up, they can vote. And I, you know, I know it, I, we are not going to be the people who are going to lead this, because, you know, we're we can do so much, and you know, we're focused on grassroots. There is going to have to be an attempt to make people feel safe at the, going to the polls, I believe. And there's somebody's going to have to do the legal work to try and make sure that American citizens don't have their franchise removed illegally. But there's definitely been a history of people not only trying to do this, but systematically doing it. And it's, you know, we talk about, you know, that's why I started by saying basic American values. Basic American value, number one, you're an American citizen, you get to vote. That's the democracy. And so, you know, I, there's nothing more basic in terms of us having a representative government than that. And so I take it, you know, incredibly seriously. Okay, we, we have a, a couple more people, or one more person. We'll pull out Tom, Tom, being really patient. Yes. Yes, related to your last question, um, talking about, you know, we need to win elections to, to change things. Um, the Electoral College, you know, have yeah. you put any effort into abolishing this historic nasty thing? We have a system that has we started, to, what was it, 225 years ago? Something like that, maybe more, 230 years ago. And it has a lot of things in it that we probably wouldn't do today. Look, I'm from a state of 40 million people. We have two senators. Wyoming has 400,000 people. They have two senators. We are literally 100 times bigger, their votes, count a hundred times more than our votes. That's an amazing fact. You look at the gerrymandering that's going on. It's hopefully we'll get undone and we'll go. I know Arizona's actually really good on this. California's really good on this. Both times people went to the polls to say let's have nonpartisan, you know, line drawn, which I think is great. So the Electoral College, I believe that, you know, the Electoral College was some combination of not trusting the popular vote because they didn't trust human beings and there was still a sort of sense of aristocracy and you know the, the you know fearing the rabble we are the rabble i'm looking at this one you are the rabble you are exactly what they were worried about and yet it's really hard to change it because in order to change that would be it, it, there are people who are i know people who've spent five to ten years trying to change it and you know maybe someday it will work, but the fact of the matter is, making change. When was you know when was the last time that we had a constitutional amendment? 
No, 40s. 40s. I'm just telling you, it's, we are not, until, I actually think the issue in our society to a very large extent is what I started out, which is trust. If we trust that we're trying to, each, are trying to get to the right place and disagree how to get there, that is fine. <coughs> that is fine. That is traditional democracy. The issue we have is that trust is not there. And we will go as a society just as far as we can trust each other. And unless we can get back to that, we're going to have a very, very tough time. Honest to goodness. So I mean, I, as much as I'm saying, boy, I sound pretty partisan, I am pretty partisan because I really believe that for us to succeed as a society, we have to get back. I don't want any cynicism. I believe really we have to get back to literally original American values of inclusiveness and respect for each other. And if we do that, and we, you know, and if we disagree about the right tax rate or anything like that, that's fine. That's par for the course. But the question is, we have to get back to a question where we're actually looking forward to trying to do the right thing for the most Americans. When we get there, we'll, then the fact that we differ about the way to get there is, it is something that's always been true and should always be true because nobody has a monopoly on wisdom. With that, we're going to have Thank <laughs> you.